So welcome everybody, I'm Lucy Brown. I'm the Director of Nursing and Deputy Director of the Florence Nightingale Foundation Academy. And I have the great pleasure of hosting our webinar series. It's uh, one of my favorite parts of my job, I'll be honest, we get to hear from fantastic speakers. Um, and if any of you are interested in sharing your expertise, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so this morning, we've got the great pleasure of um, welcoming Leon Carhill, who's got a great um, background in health tech and being a health tech advisor and mentor. He's also a national advisor to NHS England on all areas in health tech and digitalization. Um, and he's also the founder of Sector 3 Digital and he helps frontline organizations um, to become more digital. So we're really, really excited to welcome Liam this morning. He's going to teach, uh, talking to us this morning about um, health, digital health um, revolution, which I'm really excited. We're hoping to create a movement, aren't we, Liam? So if you want to get involved, let us know. Um, but we really want to kind of move forward uh, the nurse entrepreneurs and getting involved in the digital uh, movement as well. So hopefully this should inspire you and give you some food for thought. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end today. So if you've got any questions, you can pop it in the chat box or um, obviously raise your hand, your, your digital hand or your actual hand, and we can ask questions to Liam at the end. We've got about 15 minutes um, for questions at the end. So we're looking forward to welcome you all. Um, so without further, we will be recording, obviously we're recording the webinar this morning, so be mindful of um, any, um, anything that you pop in the chat box or any comments that you make. And if you have any issues with that, with this, please do let us know. So without further ado, I'm going to hand across to Liam, who's going to share his insights on the digital revolution. So thanks, Liam. Welcome. Hello, everybody. And uh, for those of you whose faces I can see, it's really nice to see you today. Um, it's nice to be starting off the year by actually sort of, you know, doing, doing a few sessions with some, some folks from the front line. Um, I will uh, tell you my bias now that like uh, working with working with clinicians, nurses, therapists and so on is something that I on and off get the chance to do sort of have been doing for a lot for well, quite a while now. And uh, it's one of my favourite things. I really one of my favourite moments in my work that I do is when we get to do some work on digital and you can kind of see the sparks and people realize what digital can mean for their day jobs and it's one of it's one of my one of my favorite things but today I have the very easy task of talking about the digital industrial revolution what it's going to mean for care and how that might affect your role and I've got 40 minutes so um eek I think is the uh is the summation so let me just um show my screen and we will start off so um right uh so hopefully you can see my screen I'm just gonna okay mm. Okie koki. So today's big mission. Um, well, we've got quite a lot of things that we're going to be covering, and we're going to be having some cameo roles from Tom Cruise, um, from House MD, and from C3PO at key points during the session. But I think what we're going to be talking about initially is what is the digital, the digital revolution that we're going into? What are the kind of things that this means for us, and how is this going to manifest? And um, how would we see this start to become part of care? Because we talk about the changes we have in care. But actually what we're talking about within care is the, the digital revolution that is happening across all of society and that we're going to see in many cases. It will just that it manifests differently in terms of care. And in some cases it will manifest the same. Um, what are the kind of technologies that we would see shape the next generation of care? And I suppose what, what, what could care look like and what does this mean for you and potentially for your role? Um, so this is a whistle stop. I calculated that this is usually around about six hours that I do. We've got 40 minutes. So it, there will be some, some speed talking and some whistle stopping. So please forgive me. I suppose first introduction is just very briefly. As I said, um, I work with frontline organisations, predominantly community health service organisations. Uh, I'm working with palliative care provider at the moment. And what I've been doing over a number of years um, is trying to basically see how we can make the environments better for digital rather than just plonking digital technology on people's heads and you know basically having people live with the consequences of IT dare I say the term um, trying to look at how we can actually understand what digital really is and what it really means in terms of something that will shape how our organizations come together what we do all of those different things that surround it the skills we're going to need and the kind of cultural changes that we, we're going to see and that are already coming through now um, I like to call myself a geriatric millennial um, also I've been recently defined as it and I I took the tag on, which kind of means I am probably at the top of the age range of those millennials, which means I grew up sort of living and breathing digital, taking computers apart and then not being able to put them back together again. And so, you know, my life has kind of been constant, sort of constant change in a digital context. Every few years, the way I communicate with my friends and so on has changed. And I suppose I'm that first raft of leaders, I suppose, who's coming through, who's 
who's really lived this kind of change that's going to continue to accelerate as we go through. And so part of my mission, I think, which I never really realised until this stage, is to, is to try and really, I suppose, help bridge between those of us in the system who's had very different experiences for those who are coming through. And if we bear in mind that, I suppose, the you know, two, two small facts that the millennial workforce at the moment is now um, across society is over 50 percent and they're starting to move into leadership roles. I think we're going to start seeing a very different view. Now, this isn't in any way about making it ageist. It's just around experiences. And so I'm actually my, my, my favorite digital people are, um, are in their 60s and 70s. Um, so it's not an age point, but absolutely, I think what I'm trying to do, I suppose, to help to translate a very different way of being and way of working, which I think is going to dominate our society as we move forward. So I think the first question, because let's face it, we overuse the term revolution. Like nowadays, a new, a new brand or um, a new brand of toilet roll can be called a revolution in, you know, in the media industry. But actually, when we're talking about um, revolution, what we actually mean here is that we are talking about an industrial re re revolution in its common sense. I'm sorry, just to say for um, questions and raised hands, I'll, I'll be taking questions at the end of the session. So um, if, we, if we could just run through and then take questions at the end. Um, we are generally talking about an industrial revolution. If we take the first industrial revolution and look what happened, we took, you know, humans worked in the fields with physical power and then machines, engines came and took and basically went to take along most of, you know, the, the dominant power of humans and society. We are now going into another one where effectively, if we could put it in a nutshell, the industrial revolution is one where we are going to start to see computers and the machine come and take the cognitive tasks and the cognitive processes that we do in our society, given that largely in society we have cognitive jobs, you know, and even if we break down, you know, jobs for frontline staff, you know, moving things in system, copying things, making analytical decisions based on data and so on, you know, what, what we actually you know, what we're actually going to see is this is going to significantly change the society as we move forward in that sense. And we are, you know, I think, you know, it's unfortunately nobody ever cuts a ribbon to say welcome to the Industrial Revolution and this is where we are. And so, you know, I think hi history will look back and tell us exactly when they thought it started. But actually, if we take the factors that we see in society, we are starting to see that actually there are very few reasons left why we are to argue why we are not in this industrial revolution. You know, we have an economic necessity for growth. The system that we have in place means that we need to continue to grow and in different ways, you know, particularly if we have climate change and the other economic necessities that we have. We have stagnating productivity in the developed world and have for a long period. And actually, I think if we apply it to the care system, realistically, a lot of the analog changes that we try to bring in, particularly from 2010 onwards, we kind of of you know like the actual levels of productivity we haven't had any major jumps you know in the in the last however many years that aren't related to digital and of course in society we have an aging population or a growing old age dependency ratio which is very pertinent to health and we've been grappling with and facing and trying to understand for such a long period but across society that means that demand of people who are consuming services you know who are in the outside of the workforce will be starting to get a bigger proportion compared to those who are in the workforce so we don't have enough people to do what we need to do and all we need to do is turn on BBC News and look at the workforce um, headlines all the time that this is a real thing that's starting to happen right now. But on the positive side, what we also have is a number of really fantastic and exciting creation tools that are allowing you know, that are democratically distributed, where people can effectively build something out of nothing and create a business or a solution or an answer to a problem. Um, and a generation, as I said, that is very much minded on disruption. I think particularly since the financial crisis, we have a generation that no longer believes in institutions, moves around roles a lot more quickly, has left us of, of a contract with employers in the work, you know, as part of the workforce, and has a very different view about what their career will be. I think also there's a degree of um, anxiety and nervousness, like you know, I'm very lucky to be, you know, sort of a uh, quite successful thought leader. A lot of my work I do is creative, but I really worry for myself, uh, you know, and I worry I have anxiety, anxiety about my child, about myself and my family and those I care about being relevant in this next society that we have. And I think that is very much a, a symptom that we see within our within this gen within this new generation that's coming through. But also the technologies that are supposed to underpin some of the things I'm going to talk about, particularly artificial intelligence, are now starting to reach critical mass. We've got the different, you know, our different servers have different speeds. To, you know be able to run things we have we've spent lots of time connecting the world most people have got smartphone in their hands we have the infrastructure which is allowing these technologies to be able to do some quite exciting things and i suppose finally you know the, the mindset and you know i know that we've probably in the health service really sort of 
um, overregged the the actual change day to day that COVID has brought technologically, but actually it has brought a jumpstart in terms of some of the entrenched and cultural things, you know, across society that says actually we can't work in very different ways. I think, you know, I, we've told this story many times in many places, but actually we, that, that story now is very different. <clears throat> So one of the things that people often say is, well, you know, yeah, you know, like, yeah, if you run a shop that sells shoes or you run, you know, sell books online or something, then, you know, that's a relatively straightforward thing to be able to do. It's like it's it's not the same as health because health is complex and, you know, it, we, we have to be able to the skills that we use are very different to be able to support individuals. And in one sense, you'd be right if we look at some of the technologies we've had and try to put in place. But when we think about the future ones. I think the writing is on the wall that we're about to have an incredibly dramatic change. And hopefully most of you will be familiar with the NHS long-term plan that was put out a couple of years ago with any recent COVID editions. And if you look at some of the themes that you know are coming through, um, I put them into three categories, but I think some of the themes that you might see um, here, you know, particularly around, for example, you know, being able to do prevention and stratification, self-care, well-being, holistic, patient-centered, personalized. This is part of the day-to-day -day language. But actually, if we're really to sort of actually achieve systematic ways of being able to do this, you could say that this is a very big ambition for the long-term plan. <clears throat> and I like to reorganize the long-term plan into things that we have to stick with, the drivers. So we have, you know, aging population, workforce crisis, lots of different people retiring. We don't have as many people coming into the workforce. We have a consistent need for efficiencies because the health system is getting more and more expensive and we have increasing demand. Um, <clears throat> and so if we take the shift, the things that they want to do, or what I like to call the, you know, the objectives and aims, place-based, integrated care, self-care, outcomes-based models, you know, stopping things happening before they happen. These are all, these aren't new things, but you know, these aren't necessarily new things in terms of new ingredients we have to bake the cake. The only real new ingredient that we have within this picture is actually digital. And so, you know, I think this stresses to me that realistically digital plays an incredibly big role in doing these. And I think, you know, we're going to be trying to answer some questions that we've been asking for a long time, but have been really struggling to find a way to actually be able to make them work. You know, my hypothesis is that the reason that we've had such fragmented care, the reason, you know, in the past that we've broken things down into specific institutions rather than having it joined up is because the more complexity we have, the more difficult it is to manage. And, you know, uh, technologically, we've been trying to spend the last couple of decades to make some of the things that we've been doing more manageable. But now we've got some really big questions on this shift. How do we move away from institute based assessment? How do we put things where the patient is in terms of community? And also what is place in a digital world? Like, you know, at the end of the day, place for many people, if you go on a bus is wherever their smartphone's taking them at that individual time. Integration, how do we integrate care for complex humans that and support it and actually make it cohesive in a manageable way you know like I think if you talk about you know we, we try to say that we're moving towards a house of care but a lot of the district nurses that I talk to who are so busy running around from place to place trying to support you know realistically that the best the best amount of integration that we can do is is trying to you know make hurried calls to social services in between a really you know really incredibly punishing caseload and so integration is is, a, is an interesting concept but it's also a very challenging one for many nurses I know in day-to-day -day and therapists too. And then also well-being, holistic, patient-centered, personalized. What we're trying to say is how do we see the patient and how do we not deliver cookie cutter care? How do we not basically say, well, this is your condition and this is the pathway and this is the route that you're going to follow and it's the same route that everybody else follows and actually make it about wider combined and health and life needs and not just about that conditional pathway. Because you know and I know that actually that isn't necessarily entirely fit for purpose because there are so many other determinants of people's hair, people's hair, maybe of their health, um, that actually makes it difficult for that, you know, that actually means that we need to be trying to, to take different approaches to different people, you know, and many, you know, many, many, many of the individuals who are working with patients are absolutely trying to do that, but there isn't really a lot of technological support that does this. I suppose to the two of the biggest ones though is, well, given that, you know, realistically, the difference between a good outcome and a bad outcome is usually what happens in the day to day life of the patient. And if we take self care, you know, we try to give great advice, we try to give, you know, information with the with the, with the time that we have. But realistically, you know, given how much nudging and support that Amazon 
gives you nowadays on buying, I don't know, a new phone or a piece of technology that maybe you don't even want. Like we think about how big technology has moved forward in terms of being able to nudge our behaviours to drive the outcomes that they want. You know, if, if you look at the parity between those and what we're able to do in the health system, there's a very large difference between those two. But then I suppose the biggest one, and this, to be honest, is what I call the um, the big bet on the future of the health system and whether it can be sustainable is can we spot when bad things are going to happen and stop them happening, which is an incredibly like, you know, beyond what we're currently doing. How do we do that? Well, you know, it's not like we can basically have, you know, one nurse to one patient or one clinician to one patient following them around, supporting and watching everything. We, something different needs to happen. And so these are very big questions. The other questions, again, that we have is, well, how do we do this for more people? with greater need, greater numbers of multimorbidities and, you know, conditions, um, with less money and less staff, you know, we've more or less squeezed the hell out of the lemons over the last decade. And, you know, we just need to look at the system that we're in at the moment and some of the challenges, but absolutely we are, we are really, you know, it's a really big question to ask. I think the answer is that it's all predicated on digital technologies being able to fulfill and support these ambitions. And what I'd like to do is to try and take you through some of these. Um, one of the biggest things I think that we're looking in this into, you know, to be able to support this ambition is our ability to get as close to the real time of the individual, to be able to understand the real time, but also to be able to be in the real time, to be able to support those patients as they are living their day to day lives. But the reality, unfortunately, is with the challenges we have with the workforce, with, you know, with the amount of caseload, like we're in the middle of an elective recovery crisis, that actually, you know, somebody turns up in a doctor's surgery, as an example, they have white coat syndrome, um, maybe they're symptomatic, maybe they're not symptomatic, maybe they feel like mentioning something which is really important, maybe they don't want to worry the doctor um, or, or the nurse when they see them. And realistically, what this gives us is just a sliver of a sliver of a view and we have to be able to make decisions about what's in front of us of course for those areas where we're working with more complex patients in different kinds of ways that's absolutely less analog but the majority of interactions in the nhs are probably much more analog than digital you know we have some technologies that we use but we are in an age where actually analog technologies are in place if i could just ask somebody to just um keep an eye on muting that'd be really great thank you um i think when we talk about health you know, what we, we have a very romanticized view about care. And for any of you who've seen the program House MD, I think it's compulsory on sort of doctor and nurse training, isn't it? That you watch like, you know, that you watch ER and House MD and stuff like that to see the sort Great, of Grey's romanticized. Grey's Anatomy too, Liam. Grey's, Grey's Anatomy, Anatomy, that's yeah, the yeah, one. I was, I've forgotten the name. I'm not a clinician, <laughs> so I didn't have that on my, uh, <laughs> on my reading list. But I think, you know, what we often see is that we have this romanticized view about what healthcare is. And that, you know, like basically if you turn up in a hospital, this crazy doctor, you know, with a brain, the size of Switzerland is going to turn up and you know and they're they're gonna you know interrogate your family and do weird stuff to you and break into your house and swab under your sink to look at different kinds of mold and look at the things that you've been watching on tv and maybe ask big questions about your relationship with your parents and maybe they didn't tell you the truth about a particular thing that happened you know and that's the kind of thing that we like to you know that we kind of like to tell ourselves that it's going to be and obviously that gets destroyed as we have to go into general practice and get a six minute consultation but that Oh, but actually, the things that we are looking to be able to see and achieve is stuff that could almost kind of emulate what House MD does. You know, this romanticized version actually is, is, the, is are these things, what we would ideally as you, service users, because we're all patients too, of course, we'd like all of the meaningful data to be used to support the decisions. We would like people to be able to not just see that slice of time, but real time established patterns, trends, and real insight about what's going on in our life. You know, our biological markers and our blueprints, our predispositions, the things that basically, you know, tell us the, you know, tell us the schematic of us as a human being. We also want them to be able to see things and help us to spot trends and use that knowledge and expertise before they happen, because often we don't know. It's not, you know, as a patient, we, we or maybe we do know and we can't change it. We want our care to be personalised. We want to try and respond on what would work for us as an individual. And actually what we want is real support that can use active ways of nudging and coaching us. You know, as humans, we are our own worst enemies, you know, and I say that having eaten two cinnamon buns this morning <laughs> um like you know like we are our own worst enemy and i knew it was a bad idea to eat two cinnamon buns and i'd end up speaking really fast but you know that's that's just us as human beings and you know we do need new ways of being able to be supported in terms of uh, helping us to help ourselves 
We cannot do this now. This is not a reality, it's not a possibility. Many of these things are not things that we can do now. And so our view of House MD is entirely fictional. And it's a lovely fiction, we've watched it twice uh, uh, in our house, but it's not real. However, when we think about digital technologies, it's entirely possible that we might be able to do something that is much better than House MD and that could achieve all of those ambitions. <clears throat> and I'd like to tell you about them. So here is, um, and for those of you who've seen the really fantastic report by Eric Topol, MD, um, which was commissioned by Health Education England a few years ago, I think it's 20, 2018, 2017. Um, and what it does is it looks about some of the things that are coming through in the future that we would like to see. It's, it's a really great report. And I have to say, I'm a total fanboy of Eric Topol. I got the opportunity to meet him and I said no, because I felt too nervous because he's just, his thinking is absolutely amazing. And some of the things that he puts forward is great. And to me, it's one of the best reports by Health Education England. And what they talk about is a number of different technologies that we might start seeing coming through. And what I'd like to do is just take these apart and have a conversation with you about them and the things that we might start to see and how they can come together and be supported by technologies, predominantly such as AI, that could allow us to happen. Well, the first one, and I don't like the term telehealth. It's not my favourite term because it makes me think about people making phone calls. Um, so I use virtual and remote interactions. And of course, it's something that we've seen and used, you know, to a certain degree over the last couple of years. And you've had quite a revolution in the thinking around digital first and telehealth and so on, and using, you know, virtual consultations. But actually, the thing that we don't always remember is that when... Um, Carsten Weinhardt, the dog to the left, and Toshi on the right have a communication between each other. All of this gets broken down into ones and zeros. And that is an incredible amount of data that happens in these interactions where there is potentially meaningful information that could support us in a way that we couldn't do in front of people. Let me give you a particular example of something emerging, which I think is a piece of Microsoft software that starts to take the facial recognition of people and starts to be able to rate them based on their emotions. Imagine in mental health interactions or things, for example, where it's a Friday afternoon, we've had a really busy week, and we have something like this that is giving us information based on that data that we're seeing that is able to augment our experience. And I did a digital first session for my accelerator, actually, that I run, um, <clears throat> where, you know, we went through all of the different feed through stuff. And all you need to do is download Snapchat and you can turn yourself into a pirate or make yourself a baby, or you could potentially translate into a different language. And actually what this does is give a massive degree of accessibility that wasn't necessarily there before. The other thing around smartphones, and you know, we've looked at apps and generally the apps that we've had in the past have been very basic information, education apps. You know, it's basically feeding information, expecting people to do them things themselves. But actually the reason that big tech has managed to sort of wheedle their way into, weasel their way into our lives so much is because this is the most important piece of real estate on the planet. And I think pretty much all of you will have one of these and you'll probably have spent more and more time over the years using them. You're probably, some of you may even be actively trying to spend less on time than because of the dominance it has in your life. Now, given in the world that we have now, where we have things that are popping up and nudging you and asking you, or suggesting that you do things or interact with specific pieces of content, whether that be Facebook or Amazon or whatever it is, we have a piece of technology here that can actively support you and connect with you and also act as a bridge to be able to get extra data. And this piece of technology as it evolves in the future is gonna to continue to play that in whatever form it does. So this is such an important piece of technology that we need to be able to get things on, you know, to be able to do different things on. One of the most, I think one of the most interesting areas at the moment is around our internet of things, sensible sensors and wearables for, you know, diagnostics, remote monitoring, um, you know, uh, uh, virtual wards that we're seeing now as a very big piece of policy. And there's a number of different ways. Again, what we're starting to do is we're starting to see a use of a smartphone here. So if we take, for example, healthy IO, you know, what we have here is the ability, for example, to use a smartphone to remotely look at a wound or to be able to do a urinalysis for somebody who doesn't necessarily need to come into a bricks and mortar institute. And their smartphone, all they need to do is be sent a particular pack or to be able to be able to do this, um, you know, to be able to to be able to just get something on their phone, to be able to take a picture and to be able to ascertain whether they're at risk of having a urinary tract infection. That doesn't require a nurse time it doesn't require a you know it doesn't require you know the the pull upon the services and we already have a real revolution that's starting to take place in point of care and self-testing for those of you who've had any exposure or been involved with sexual health you'll see how far it's been going in that direction too 
Self-monitoring. Well, we talk about self-monitoring, but actually, if we take, you know, I don't know how many of you actually have uh, an Apple Watch on your hand right now or a Fitbit or something like that. But we're starting to see a real revolution from the tech industry around starting to be able to collect lots of different areas of data. In the past, and I'm sure you're you know, familiar with this, patient gets diabetes and we give them a device where they can pinprick their, their you know, pin, um, prick their blood, be able to do um, remote monitoring. It might be they call up and say what they did, or it might be now that these ones are starting to kind of do it in a way where the data automatically gets sent. But if we talk about the future and what we're going to see, like there's the amount of meaningful data that we're going to start getting from people's phones, in their, sorry, from their phones connected to smart devices that could be usable, that could look at their blood pressure, their blood glucose level, their stress levels, their heart rate levels, all of the different things that they do when they're going for a run. Actually, there were some really interesting indicators that suggested that we could have spotted COVID using, um, you know, using these smartwatches before you get a positive test. And this is going to continue and continue where actually what we're talking about is physical devices that are not just going to be things that we deploy in the system, but actually going to be part of day to day that we see. And that this data is going to be potentially really usable to improve people's health outcomes. Um, for those who have, you know, been involved in, you know, the increased amount of discharge of patients from hospital and the virtual wards and so on, you know, this is a really big thing at the moment, and NHSC, INX are really pushing this hard. But if we take at the moment that there are things where you can put out something that goes on someone's arm, um, they can go at home, and you can almost have, you know, IC, maybe not ICU, but you can have observational data, which, you know, can feed through to a health system, this automatically means that place starts to look very different, and then we have many opportunities using these i do think the lines will start to blur between these two as they go through and they'll get smaller and we might just start to see that some of these things just get pulled in people's day-to-day -day care you know or that it just starts to be used in lots of different ways but then also you know often missed under the radar we have video and just to use this example you know take for example you have patients in palliative care or in care home environments who may be high risk you know maybe they've had breathing difficulties what about if we can just use video in their room to be able to interpret their breathing rate and their heart rate or potentially for patients patients with dementia um, who uh, might get out of bed quite a lot, you know, to be able to look at the caseload in care. And all of this is, is data, you know, for us to be able to see and us to be able to use, which is real time, whilst people are awake, whilst they're sleeping. And then finally, and these two companies that I know very well and have worked with in the past, um, um, we have companies such as Outcurist that start to look at, you know, um, start to look at day-to-day -day movements. So fridge monitors and things like that, that people can have, you know, that people can put into their homes and we can start to utilize their friends and family more to be able to help see how they're doing. But also if we take, for example, PCO Health, what we might start to see is that sensors and videos for patient monitoring might start to become part of the self-care arrangement. So we drop a nudge saying, could you drop your or, you know, could you just get on the on the physical scales? Could you just use this device and we'll remotely check it to see how you're doing? And then we'll give you a call to just sort of see how things are. All of this is effectively stuff that a human might be coming to take at the moment with a workforce which is incredibly burdened. So I think it's increasingly at the moment very easy to see how we could start to utilize if it's not entirely clear about how those models would work. And then we have genomics, which Eric Topol describes as the most exciting field for the future of health. And I'm inclined to agree. And if you're not familiar with genomics, what we mean by this is um, taking a sample to be, able to, to be able to take the blueprint of a human being. And if we take the amount of data points that you mean, about this, oh, my uh, headset's telling me my battery's low, I might need to change in a second, um, is that what we are expecting is that with the current view of genomics, it's expected there are a number of billion data points, I think it's three, of which we're expecting there's going to be two million data points that could be relevant to health around all of our you know, all of our different, all of our different markers. Now, all I've got to do, I suppose, in my mind is think about the uh, journey that my sister had with spinal muscular atrophy, which obviously, you know, most of you will be aware is a genetic condition, which, uh, which can uh, have a, uh, a very sad ending for, you know, for, for young children and their parents. And uh, effectively, the, the genomics has been used to create a drug that can change the the, the genetic makeup of one of these individuals who has a particular marker missing, we can think about the amazing potential. But if we think about this as a data point as well, what we can think about is that there are significant, you know, that's a significant amount of data. If we take the most complex patient that you've ever worked with, and we take all of the, the, the data points that would be in the system that we would record in your patient record system now, 
it's not in the millions, it's maybe in the thousands. So what we're talking about is an incredible and exponential growth of the amount of data that is usable that could support us to be able to make better decisions around patients. Then we have things like speech recognition and natural language processing. Uh, in advance of this session, actually, I had to make sure I turned off my Google Home device so it didn't answer me when I, when I spoke about this, um, because if I say the word Google Home, it listens to me. And actually, we, we, in our day to day, we've got speech recognition and natural language processing. Technologically, this might be one of the most significant changes in society, which I can't go into because it's quite complex. But, I, but effectively, what we could start to see, for example, is that when we're doing a video or in-person consultation, that it's, it's codifying all of the conversation that we are having between clinician and patient between nurse and patient, therapist and patient, so on, and that, we, that it's being used to, um, that it's basically being used to take the data points out of the conversation, maybe even things that we may not know, such as sentiment, like, for example, um, 111 um, is starting to use a sound recognition to be able to see whether people might potentially be at risk of suicide when they call up, and that it would be able to offer a flag on that. It's a really interesting one that's developing at the moment. But what about if in real time, it's starting to take out all of the different points, and in front of you, using, you know, structuring the language, it's starting to maybe make suggestions based on the different parts of the data for an individual so the conversations that we are having start to be formed up in a way where we can start to use that as data you know also just thinking about the, when you when you're trying to in maybe in your car you know write your notes after visiting a patient on a remote device and then the network goes down and all of those different things that nurses often experience like you know particularly those in community obviously um then you know like this is this is something where there's a lot of opportunity for um, for efficiency as well. Um, you probably be aware, hopefully, be aware of you know some of the some of the developments we've had in image interpretation. You know, radiology is the example that's used quite a lot, and actually, you know, it's already believed that there are algorithms that are more likely to spot specific things um, <clears throat> specific things in scans than. Yeah, than radiologists themselves. And there's been big discussions about what's the future of a radiologist. What does this mean? But actually, if we take the concept of an image, you know, there's definitely great uses for images, being able to spot things in cancer. There's a particular uh, case here on the right where it looked at um, six US radiologists um, that they missed, but the AI system caught them. What does this mean? Sorry, um, yeah, um, what does this mean in these scans? And actually, of course, in things like MRI scans, cancer, you know, and so on and so forth, we're going to see these. But actually, if we take what is an image, you know, particularly a digital image, it's an imprint of something meaningful. So actually this could, as we've sort of covered, it could be something that's visual, maybe a video, maybe it's a sound bite, maybe it's a 3D scan of something and more. And so actually, if we start to think about breaking down these images, then there's whole kinds of different things that we'd be able to use to be able to hopefully improve our ability to spot things, to not miss things, you know, to improve the specificity of our diagnoses. And um, so we can, you know, so we can routinely support these. Um, also, AI is entirely scalable. There is no workforce challenge with AI. You know, at the end of the day, it's, you can upscale it as much as you need. So it doesn't have workforce challenges in the same way that the NHS does. Um, interventional robotics is a really interesting one. And I think everyone's kind of like, yeah, whatever, like robots coming around and kind of like doing stuff. That's just too sci-fi. But actually, if you look at Japan, particularly within the care system, um, they've had um, an aging population. They've been feeling the crises for, uh, I think it's a decade ahead um, of um, a lot of the uh, Western democracies. And what, they're start what they've had to do is that desperate times have called for desperate, oh, has, uh, has been a cause for desperate measures. Sorry, one second, my audio has just gone on my headset, so I'm just going to turn this off. Um, sorry. I'm still here, uh, so it's all okay. One moment. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm flying blind, I can't hear you, so um, I'm going to hope that you can still hear me. Can I just uh, double check that, Lucy, uh, you can still hear me, good. Okay, yeah, good. reminder <laughs> to self, charge batteries in future um, and not overcomplicate what I'm trying to do uh, by having lapel mics and stuff. So what we could start to see in terms of interventional robotics is that, you know, one of the things that's expected quite soon is that it would be very possible that a robot could come around and take um, bloods. Like if you take some of the technology that is in Amazon warehouse now, um, you know, it, it's very possible that a lot of the things that people could be doing, it could do this. But actually, if we take, for example, C3PO here as an example, it may also be able to communicate with that patient in 150 different languages and, you know, be able to kind of have basic structured conversations in the same way that Google can theoretically book a hair appointment for you now. So I think if we start to think about robotics, there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of possibility and opportunity that we could start to see through this. 
So there's a lot of stuff that I've gone through here. And as I said, I was covering a lot of content in a very short period of time. But the thing that I would like you to just focus on at the moment is all of these things that I've described, you know, virtual consultations, ones and zeros, it creates data, smartphones, data, 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 smartphone, where, you know, centers and wearables, internet of things, data, 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 the genome, wow, big data. All of these things that we're doing is stuff that creates data and what an incredible amount of data. And this, I think, is where it takes us to the really sort of crazy, spooky stuff. Because the problem that we have at the moment is, let's say, for example, you know, you were given a week and for that week, you had one patient to focus on. And we've collected a load of this different kind of data and we put it in a load of spreadsheets. And you had to sit through and say, what is the best path for your patient based on this? The reality is it would be entirely impossible. You just wouldn't be able to do it because it'd be so much data. You have data overload. You have nothing comparable that you could look at. And realistically, there's no point having all of this data if we're unable as human beings to be able to deal with this. And this is the same for, you know, if you took somebody's all of them, all of my interests and shopping needs and stuff like that. And the things that I Googled and so on and gave somebody in curries all of that data and had a week to prepare about what laptop I wanted to buy. It's the same kind of thing that we see in this, in, you know, that we see in our world. So if we're to stop things happening before they happen, what we need is predictive analytics or particularly predictive algorithms and artificial intelligence that allows us to be able to say what's going to happen. And the reason the way that this would happen is that this would pull all of the data together. So this on the left actually is I was with Babylon for a while as my GP and uh, it gave me like a little area of like where I basically need to look after myself a bit more, which is basically everything on the inside. And, um, it, you know, what, what, for example, we could start to see is that we have all of this data, this major data. We've got my genomic blueprint and my smartwatch and all the things it's connecting, my heart rate and all of these things. My digitized health history in the system, but also the interactions that I've had, the video consultations, which have maybe been recorded, which I think will be a thing one day. Um, the, bio, the biological markers, the psychological markers, the social markers, our community around us, our environments, where we live, where we've been, um, light pollution, noise pollution, environmental pollution. Are we in an urban environment? Are we all of these different things, right? We've got all of these different things that starts to potentially be used for prediction. And there's already technologies that are starting to bring about this prediction now. But the real meaning and the real capability of artificial intelligence is that it can do it not just for one person, but for everyone. And what it will use is for something that's called a neural network. And a neural network basically is AI's version of trying to do what the brain does. And so what it does is it breaks down all of these individual points. It doesn't have it as big chunks of information and compares it with everybody. And this is where it uses the term digital twin, right? So what it would say, like Amazon, Amazon does when you go on Black Friday, is it will basically say, for somebody with all of these different markers on the left, who is most likely, and based on that, was intervention A or intervention B most successful? What was, the, um, what was the problems that they had? What were the things that maybe we didn't know? What was the risk score? How likely for someone who maybe drinks too much beer, has a genomic blueprint of this, uh, doesn't really do any exercise because their smartphone says, what's the likelihood of them going to hospital within the next year or the next two years? We cannot do this as human beings but AI possibly can. And this is where it takes us. And this is back to Dr. Eric Topol, massive fanboy again, very excited about him. One day he's gonna hear one of my talks and go, oh my God, I need to get a restraining order on you. But this is what he talks about the order that could go. So what we start to have is all of these inputs. Now, a lot of these inputs as well, you might see are related to social care. And I think actually, as we start, I think this technology will start to become what I call a health and social care defragmentation machine. It starts to basically create a necessity to merge a lot of this data. But what it goes into is this thing in the middle, which is a little bit like uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, where effectively it becomes incomprehensible to the human. There will probably be no human who understands <clears throat> what is being predicted and how, um, which is a scary thing. Well, I won't go down that rabbit hole. But what that means is that on the right, we start to move from individuals doing diagnosis. I was talking to a GP recently who was like, my, my future job is not going to be diagnosis. It's not going to be making decisions. It's not going to be doing this cogn cognitive stuff because all of this based on data is cognition. My job is going to be very, very different as a general practitioner. And, you know, it's really interesting to think about the conversations we have now and how irrelevant they are if we're moving into this kind of world. Because actually what we're talking about is a virtual health guide in the same way that Amazon is your virtual shopping guide. 
we'll have something that is a lot more complex that will suggest what we should do. And it will iterate and it will change and it will learn over time. And so what I often see when I talk to, to, to people within the frontline workforce is I get a degree of scepticism and they're like, I wouldn't trust that. How on earth am I ever going to come to the point of trusting that? Like, it, well, I suppose there's a couple of different points. I suppose the first one is, if we want to use this data to have a real leap in health, do we have a choice? Do uh, can like can if we can find if there's some injection we can give to humans that that quantiples is that a word that, that that increases that increases the size of their brain so much that they can compute all of that? Then great, maybe that's a good thing. Quantiples. There you go. Um, um, but um, I suppose if I could just provide a parallel where maybe we would have said the same thing. Now, I remember as a child, I was, you know, bank holiday, driving down to see my family in Essex. My mum and dad were arguing in the car. Should we take the, dare take the M25? Oh, maybe it's okay at this time. You know, maybe there probably won't be an accident. It's quite early. Or would we take the 404 and do that hedge? You know, we drove around. Should we do this? Nowadays, that argument doesn't really exist because we're competing with Google. And realistically, like people trust Google so much, they drive off a cliff and they drive like, you know, Google is the thing. And if I got in a car and my partner said, oh, no, I think we should take this different route. And Google said, no, it's going to be three hours and nine minutes to this place. I know who would win that argument. It wouldn't even be an argument. But as we move forward in the future, it's very possible that we might be getting in a car and actually, we think about the logical decisions we make. Stop, start, move left, move right. Um, you know, stop at the lights, let this person through, slow down because something's ahead. All of these decisions, all of this strategic thinking or tactical thinking is expected to be, you know, there's a, there's a pilot going on in Milton Keynes right now where they're ferrying people from the university. There's lots of things where people are now starting to put their faith. And we have maybe an interesting few years but why would health be so different? Maybe that A to Z on the left could be how, about how we talk about the BNF in a number of years. Maybe we could go, oh, do you remember when you used to like look, Google, look at someone's condition and kind of go, you know, respiratory and then pick the items? Like, you know, we may look at that in the same kind of way in the future. So I suppose it comes to the question, well, what, what, what will my job look like? Well, not my job. Um, I don't know what my job will be in that, in that time, but for the clinical workforce. Well, I'm going to borrow from Topol again. And um, this tells the story of Tom the nurse. And I won't tell the whole story, but it's quite, it's quite an interesting, uh, interesting view. But what it talks about is the role that digital health technologies are playing. And I remember something at the beginning, I was working with a group of um, was it health visitors, was it, um, district nurses, I can't remember exactly who, but, but there was a group of people that were quite unhappy about the amount of time they were spending training people to use Zoom. And they said, it's not my job to train people to use technology. And that really resonated with me. I thought, that's interesting, isn't it? Because in the future, it may very well be a significant part of the future nurse's job to train people about using the technologies, because those technologies could and would be the difference between them having positive and negative outcomes, and that will be seen as the expectation. And if we take all of this information, all of the, you know, using genomics, all of the big data points, what we're going to start seeing is that we're helping people to navigate their personal health plans. So what we start to see is more coaching around, you know, not the diagnosis itself, not the things around that, but actually trying to incorporate and explain to people what all of this means and, and, and how we can say with certainty that, that, that root X is better than root Y. But then finally, if we're to be in people's real time, what happens when something meaningful comes up in that real time? And it says, um, this person has just, you know, this person is wobbling, you know, we're seeing that their mobility's decreased from their smart sensors in the, their care home room, and a big risk score comes up, a real time alert, you know, um, like my nan, I just think about my nan when, you know, used to come around and collect warfarin like what, once or twice a month and then make decision based on it, and I knew that she was so jumpy in what she had. Like, think about that, where it basically says that the INR, you know, the INR figures are X, Y, and Z, and actually, well, it might be that we actually start to take those risk scores and remotely we'd be saying, okay, you know, Mrs. Singh, could I just, can, can you increase your, can you increase your warfarin or whatever you're taking that time and, you know, and increase it by half a pill or whatever that might be, because actually the, the things that we're taking off your remote data is telling us we need to do that. That effectively then becomes a remote intervention, but it also means that we're more in there real time. I wonder as an extension of that, where we might start to see that actually, well, there's a really interesting thing around voting. What about if artificial intelligence could take all of our data and tell us how we're going to vote with such a high degree of certainty that it became pointless as voting? What about if it just voted for us based on what we saw? Maybe we could see something similar in terms of artificial intelligence and care. Like actually, if the real time, if, if we see that 99.9% .9 of clinicians when seeing a risk score respond positively to suggestion X, 
why do we still need the clinician to respond to X? Maybe they would get a summary the next morning and then have a, have a different kind of interaction with them. So we've got some really interesting views in the future around what could happen. And I think this is going to very much change the roles of a lot of people who are dealing with complex patients. And so hopefully, I think what we will see in terms of how this moves across, just a quick time check is, oh, getting there in terms of time, is that I think we're going to start seeing new tools that come through and we're going to learn to use them. And that's going to be a big journey for frontline, you know, the frontline workforce um, that allows them to design solutions. What we're talking quite often, if we take Internet of Things and we take smart monitoring devices, they are a set of tools that we can use to try and design solutions. And we've got a big period of learning around this. So, like I, you know, the amount of research opportunities around how we can create digital pathways using remote monitoring is significant. It's a really exciting area. More local ownership. Like, I really genuinely believe that for us to be able to start to codify clinical work, we need empowered clinicians working in digital and, up, and updating their hard skills, how to use these new technologies and devices, but also soft skills around creativity. And this isn't just, you know, this is something, you know, creativity, um, coming up with ideas, finding meaning, trying to ask big questions and solve problems and to almost to be able to continue to evolve technology that should be constantly evolving. We're going to see loads of national and local initiatives to create digital infrastructure, like look at virtual wards that came out just before Christmas, very significant. And this is a big, big step for the NHS. And, you know, we've been kind of piddling around for the last couple of years, but this is really going to put a big chunk into this. But also you're going to start getting more and more data. And I think to avoid overwhelm and sort of, you know, uh, in lots of different complex areas. And actually, I think the solution will partially come from the fact that we get to a point where we've already got GPs. You've got people turning up to their GP with, look, I've just done 23andMe and here's my genomic profile. What are you going to do about it? And GP's like, I don't know. Do I even have the insurance to look at this? What is this thing? And we're going to start seeing this thing as we move forward. That's going to be really interesting. So I think a lot of these things are almost inevitabilities that we're going to see come through. And actually, the best thing that we can do is try to be part of the discussion, to bring our questions, our concerns around bias and that, and to actually be empowered as you know, as clinical champions within this. So the shift has good bits, it has bad bits, it has unknown bits. But to be honest, I think the writing's on the wall that actually it's a lot of inevitable change for us. And whether we like it, whether we're scared of it, whether we're excited by it, I don't know what feelings you have based on some of the things that I've, you know, elucidated in this talk. But the reality for me is I'm not positive or negative about the digital revolution. I just see it as inevitability and we need to make the most of it, really. Digital is not the same as IT. And it could very well empower you to do amazing things. I work with frontline services and those moments when they realize that digital is not something that hits them on the head like IT has done for years and they have to live with consequences. It's something really amazing to embrace. And I, if I were you, if I were your leaders of your teams and so on, I would be demanding those tools and saying, give us the ability and the agency to be able to come up with solutions. Um, we don't have time. I was going to tell you a story about a neuro, um, neuro disability service who came up with something I never could have thought of from having a piece of technology. And I was so proud and it just made me realize you guys solve problems all day long. We should put the tools in your hands to solve the problems and make it understandable and accessible. And if we can do that, then maybe that revolution can be quite positive. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope you've been a good audience. I think you're there. All I've seen is my screen. So uh, I'll jump over, try and sort my audio out quickly. And um, yeah, I'd love some reflections and questions really. So back over to Lucy. Thanks, Liam. Wow. <laughs> I hope I speak for everybody. That that was um, an absolutely amazing um, presentation. So thank you so much food for thought. Um, about how we can we can all be part of the digital revolution. I think I completely agree with you that let's embrace it. Um, and as empowered clinicians, let's go forward and do more. There are lots of lots of enthusiasm for people. So we're open to questions. Uh, this is your chance. We've got we've got ten minutes or so to ask Liam anything. Um, he's also on LinkedIn and Twitter. So if you wanted to follow him, he's he's um, got a great following there and he shares loads of great ideas. So I just I'll plug that too for you. Um, so any questions who would like to, so I think Wasim, you've had your hand up for quite a while. Would you like to ask um, Liam a question? Well, it's just gone down again. Anybody else? So lots of, lots of great positive comments. Um, oh, so Christine, hi, Christine. Are you happy to put your camera on so we can see you? I think you might need to unmute yourself. Hi, hi. Christine, morning. Yes, morning. Yeah, yeah, we can, thank you. Hi, sorry, I've had, um, issues with my internet so I missed a part of um, the presentation towards the end. Um, Liam was saying that, um, uh, what did he say, digital 
feels different from IT. Um, mm. I missed why. Do you, do you mind? So I think, okay, so if we put it, if we put it into simple terms, like IT in the past has been something where we've generally had boxes, boxes of technology, and we've given you a box and someone's designed that box. And generally there is a cookie cutter where you have to work around the needs of the box. Somebody has spent loads of money and your IT department will spend loads. Like if we talk, for example, about your risk systems, if we talk, for example, about how EPRs work at the moment, quite often you get this box and it's contained. Digital can quite often, like it is part of digital, but it's not something where you just have to live with the consequences of someone giving you a technology and you then having to try and create workarounds. Digital should be the other thing. If digital is done properly and you have creation tools, then what this can mean for you is that actually, like if for example, we take um, Microsoft Teams, which is, you know, people are starting to get to use, you know, it's an open system and you have the ability to build things that suit you, that work around your work. So, you know, I used to, when I was working in front lines, I was like, digital should feel like a digital cuddle. You should be able to build it around you so it fits the thing that you're trying to do. And so digital should be something that empowers you. It gives you ability to personalize it and to make it fit. Other stuff that lands on you and that you have to work around to me is IT. And I think there's a clear distinction. I think there's also problems in many IT departments, in many organizations who have an IT mindset. And this is why sometimes they take fantastic digital technologies and they turn it into, into IT. So to me, and with the organizations I work with, what I try to do is to help them think differently about digital. And when they can go, okay, now I understand what digital means, I can suddenly see that it's not something I have to live with the consequences. And I understand in the, in the NHS, in the workforce, the level of skepticism because the history of technology for you has generally been living with the consequences and we have to change that conversation and demonstrate um uh, demonstrate that that can be different uh, for the comment around Yuval Noah Harari yes I swallowed all of that stuff and I absolutely yeah I think the voting thing was actually from that so uh, a, a good point on that but yeah so I think digital is about a mindset it's a way of doing something in a way that we think about our technologies and I could go down a rabbit hole with that but I'll shut up now but they're, they're the two distinctions that I would say that you know between those two thanks Liam great answer thanks Christine and I think Leanne you had your hand up next so over to you Leanne yeah, hi, thanks, Liam. That was absolutely amazing. Um, and I, my background is, I'm midwife by background, but I led a project last year to um, digitalise kind of screening information for, um, for, for women in, in pregnancy. So I'm completely, completely on board. But I'm just thinking that we had to consider a lot was kind of like the, the screening inequality, some was health inequalities and digital exclusion. Yeah. So what about the people that can't or you know don't have the capacity to access the tools don't have the smartwatch don't have the smartphone um how 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 do we get around that i think it's a very important question and it's probably the most important question of our time i think realistically i think what what we what we need to see emerge and you know i remember like i was working with a community health provider during the you know during the pandemic and we were trying to see how we could solve immediate problems as quickly as humanly possible as you'll be familiar with and um, one of the things was that actually what we needed to almost do is think about a pathway of something where we can do as digital. And it's, a, you know, and I suppose the thing is, it's like at the end of the day, you know, if if we took a different non-digital context and said, can we do this with the patient? Is it possible, for example, for them to move around and get up the stairs? No. OK, we give them a, we give them a stair lift. We give them something so they could like. I, I like to think about the future of digital and deployment that can be around a bit around occupational therapy. Can we give them something that can help them with this? And I think more resources will go in. But then beyond this, if we can't, if there are certain patients that we just can't see in this way and can't do, then that's part of our pathway. And I think realistically, our new pathway that we would that we would expect to see is around capability and us understanding. And I think the key thing is probably not necessarily working about how we solve it, but how we're cognizant of it and how we understand that there's different routes about how we can deliver services because no one should have said or has said that all services can be digital can deliver digitally but maybe in the next 10 years maybe the proportion will be so high that it will look different so I think it's you know I think it's quite it's quite it's quite key that I think it's more of an, I think the answer is more around empathy, you know, I suppose structural empathy, thinking about it within our processes and what we can and can't do within our SOPs more than I suppose, how could we solve it now? But it's, it's such an important point because yes, we, you know, we do have differences in what people can do and what they can access and what their infrastructure is. Um, I think we've actually run over time. So I can see a few people have to um, 
have to leave the meeting, but thank you so much for joining um, this morning. I hope you found it useful. We have recorded it because I'm really aware that Liam has covered so many topics in a bit of a whistle-stop tour. So you can um, go back and listen. It'll be available in a few days on our YouTube channel, which we'll share the link with you. And please do share with colleagues as well, far and wide. We really want to kind of increase the awareness of the digital solutions and hopefully create a movement for the digital revolution as well. Um, What's really great, I just wanted to summarise really is, is Liam, I really like the idea that you leave from the front and you listen to the front line to help input these solutions, but also about empowering ourselves as nurses and midwives to lead this change and transform. And there was a few bits in the chat, which I haven't got a chance to kind of explore it in more detail, but around that behaviour change piece about how we can be part of this change. Um, so now go and, talk, um, go and talk to your more senior nurses and midwives in your organisation, see if you, you haven't got a CNIO within your organisation, go and ask why. Go and knock on the door, be brave and be bold. Um, but what would be really interesting, we do have another webinar next week, which I'm, I'm actually leading on. And it's about mentorship, which is about you know, empowering that frontline, empowering our clinicians, our fellow nurses and midwives to share their ideas. So actually this kind of lead, leans on quite nicely from this. You know, we have an obligation if you're more senior nurses to bring that next generation through. And they have lots of wonderful ideas that they can share to inform us um, and make sure that we're providing the best care for our patients across Across all healthcare systems. So thank you all. I'm so sorry we've run out of time, but what a great, great morning, Liam. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Hopefully okay. you'll come back and join us again maybe in a couple of months to update. I'd love to hear more about the genomic side as well. And I'm an Eric um, Topple fan as well. So great to hear his work. Thank you all. Thanks for your discussion, your your um chat and um, your questions as well. And we'll see you soon. Take care all. Thank you.